Hello everyone and welcome back. So last class we worked really hard to prove that the fundamental group of the circle was isomorphic to the integers. This class we get the payoff. So I'm gonna have three applications of the calculation of this fundamental group, some within topology, some outside of topology. Let's get right to it. So the first theorem I want to show you is Brouwer's fixed point theorem for maps between D2 and D2. So here is the theorem. It says that every continuous map between D2 and itself has a fixed point. And what do I mean by that? I mean uh, f of x naught is equal to x naught for some x naught inside of d2. So this is a very important theorem, and it actually applies in higher dimensions too, which we'll be able to prove using our more advanced techniques in the future. Uh, but for now, let's handle the case of d2. So we're going to prove this by contradiction. Suppose for all x in D2, f of x is uh, not equal to x. And what I'm going to do is define a new function r. We can then define a function r from D2 to S1 as follows. So I'll draw a picture of this. So I have a point here in X, in D2, call it X, and it's going to get mapped over here to F of X. And what I do is I draw a ray from F of X to X and I see where that hits S1, and I will call this R of X. So I'll just write that out in words. You draw a line from F of X to X, a ray, and declare R of X to be the point on S1 where this ray hits S1. So we, we needed the fact that this map had no fixed points in order to define this map, right? Because if there was a fixed point, there's no clear direction for this line to go. Okay, so we're going to get a contradiction out of this. Uh, so, first of all, note that this is continuous. Note that R is continuous. Since, I'll wave my hands a little bit, a small change in X produces a small change in f of x. Uh, that's just because f is continuous. And so a small change in r of x. So here's another important thing. Note that R restricted to S1 is equal to the identity. If I'm going to take a point here in S1, X, let's just call this X1, and I'm going to pick a point here that F maps X1 to, and then I draw this ray. Well, where does that ray hit S1? Obviously in X1. It's already there. Okay, 
So this is what's called a retraction, if you recall from a couple lectures ago. So R is a retraction. Now, here is another fact. D2 is simply connected. And the reason being is that it's actually contractible. Uh, if I take D2 and I just map all of the points sort of squishing inwards like that, that's a contraction from D2 to a point. So any loop on D2 is homotopic to a constant loop. All I do is I post-compose the map of this loop with the contraction. Great. So now let F be any loop in S1. And let's take S1 to be on the boundary in D2. So let Ft be a homotopy of F to a trivial loop. And Ft is a homotopy in D2. We know that such exists because, again, D2 is simply connected. And here's where the contradiction will come. What happens if I do R of F of T? Well, this is now a homotopy in S1. Remember, F is, is a loop in S1, and the image of R always lands inside of S1. In fact, it's, it's the identity there. So, since F1 is constant, it's constant in D2, but being a constant map, doesn't it doesn't matter where you are, so it's also constant in S1. R composed with Ft is a homotopy of F to a trivial loop. Why is that a contradiction? Well, what we showed last time is not all loops in S1 are trivial in pi 1 of S1. But this just showed that it is, and that's the contradiction. What is the assumption we made? We made the assumption that there is a map from D2 to D2 that doesn't have a fixed point. So this is a contradiction. This has a kind of cute uh, real world consequence. If you take any map of the world, crumple it up anywhere you're standing and drop it on the floor, there is always a point on the map as you dropped it on the floor, which corresponds to the exact point on the floor that, uh, that it represents on the map. So that's application number one. The next application I want to show you is just a calculation of more fundamental groups using a small lemma. So the fundamental group of tori. And dimensional tori. Here's a proposition.
if x and y are path connected spaces, then the fundamental group of the Cartesian product x cross y is the group product pi 1 of x times pi 1 of y. And I don't have to specify base points here because these spaces are path connected. Here's a proof. So in general, a map f from z to x cross y is continuous if and only if f of z is equal to g of z comma h of z where g from z to x and h from z to y are continuous. Okay, now let f from i to x cross y be a loop. And let's worry about base points a little bit. Uh, based at x naught comma y naught. Now we get a loop. G based at x naught by looking at the first factor so this map f starts at x naught y naught and so it leaves and it comes back to x naught y naught projecting onto the first factor means it starts at x naught and ends at x naught it's a loop moreover uh, we also get a loop H in Y. So I should have said this loop G is, of course, in X. And this loop H is in Y based at Y naught. So these look like a good candidate for the image of this map. But we have to be careful. The fundamental group is defined on equivalence classes of loops up to homotopy. So we need to just take care of that. Moreover, a homotopy Ft of f gives two homotopies gt and ht in x and y respectively. So this map represents homotopy classes. Uh, and of course the map I'm talking about is uh, we get a map uh, what do I want to call this? Let's say p from pi 1 of x cross y to pi 1 of x cross pi 1 of y by the homotopy class of f gets sent to the homotopy class of g and the homotopy class of h. Moreover, if I, if I take any two loops g and h like this, I get a loop f in the space x cross y. So this map is bijective. And you can also check quite easily that it's a homomorphism. So these groups are isomorphic.
So now we have two ingredients to play with. We have the fundamental group of the circle and we have the behavior under products. Let's look at spaces that are products of circles. These are called n tori. So here's the definition. The n-dimensional tori, or torus, is the space usually called t to the n, s1 cross s1 cross cross s1, and there's n factors in here. So n times. So for example, we've seen this space before. T2 is s1 times s1. And I want to go down a little rabbit hole here and show you how to visualize these spaces. This one we've seen before. What do I do? I start with a circle and then at every point I place another circle. Something like this. And there's circles all the way around. So I get this donut shape. This homeomorphic is just a nicer picture something that looks like that. So since the fundamental group of the circle is isomorphic to Z, and the fundamental group of a product, as we've just seen, is isomorphic to the fundamental group of each of its factors crossed together, we get that the fundamental group of the torus is the fundamental group of S1 times the fundamental group of S1. And so it's Z cross Z. And here is an addendum onto the last proof. So note that if A and B generate pi 1 of x and pi 1 of y, respectively, then a cross y naught and x naught cross b generate pi 1 of x cross y. So what was the generating loop of the circle? It's pretty much, it's the circle. It's the loop that runs around the circle once counterclockwise. And so I get a generating set for this torus, which looks like this loop, A, and this loop, B. They should have some directionality. You can choose them really either way. So A and B generate the fundamental group. OK, so that was the two-dimensional torus. Now, as we up the dimension, we're going to get harder and harder spaces to visualize, in particular, the three-dimensional torus like doesn't fit inside of three-dimensional space. It's kind of a hard uh, thing to wrap your mind around, but the two-dimensional torus does. So here is a way of making the two-dimensional torus fit in a smaller space. So recall that T2 is, well, uh, you know, S1 cross S1, and S1 is 0, 1 mod the relation 0 is related to 1. So we can build T2 this way by taking two such intervals, the interval with 0 related to 1 cross the interval with 0 related to 1. So T2 can be obtained by the following. 
I start with a square, which looks like this. And these identifications, 0, 1, uh, 0 is related to one relation, forces me to glue this left side to this right side. And I glue it so that the arrows match. I could also do this flipping thing, and that's another space, which we'll get into later. But for now, I'm going to glue it so that the arrows match. So what do I get? Well, this, you could imagine if I fold this piece of paper into a tube, looks like this. So I've now glued the two red things together. I also need to glue the two blue things together. So I take the cylinder and squish it on itself. And I get exactly this torus from before. Now the red looks like this. And the blue looks like this. So what I did was... I took I cross I and glued the left to the right and the top to the bottom. Now I want to do something analogous with the three-dimensional torus. Now T3 is isomorphic to I cross I cross, well, let's just start with it's S1 cross S1 cross S1. And this is I mod Zero is related to one cross I mod zero is related to one cross I mod zero is related to one. So what this looks like, I cross I cross I is, okay, I cross I is a square and then cross that with I and you get a cube. And now I need to make these identifications. And so what I do is glue the front side to the back side, the top side to the bottom side, and the left side to the right side. And now pi 1 of T3 is going to be Z cubed. And what are these uh, generators? Well, here's something to notice. First of all, this is also S1 cross S1 cross S1. So what I do is I, I take all of these tori Okay, so in this cube, the top's glued to the bottom. And so in this square, the top is glued to the bottom. And in the cube, the left is glued to the right. And so in this square, the left is glued to the right. And so that's a torus. And if you go all the way to the front and then to the back, the, the front is glued to the back, so it comes out of the back. And that's an S1 family of tori. And here are the generators for the fundamental group, you have one loop that goes out the left and comes from the right, one loop that goes out the top, comes out of the bottom, and one loop that uh, goes out of the front and comes out of the back. So I'm going to call, this picture has gotten a little messy, let me just redraw just the cube and the generators of the fundamental group. Looks like red from left to right, blue from top to bottom, they meet in a point, and green from forward to back. Let's call them A, B, and C. And pi 1 of T3 is generated
by A, B, and C. Okay. Now there's also a notion of a four-dimensional torus, and I'll just describe this verbally for you. What you do is you take now an S1 family of these cubes, which are all glued together, and then you glue the left cube to the right cube. And you can think about what the fundamental group there is and what the generators are. In general, pi 1 of the n-dimensional torus is equal to z to the n. So just from calculating the fundamental group of the circle and this little theorem, we have an infinite family of spaces whose fundamental groups we know. So here's the last thing I want to do. I want to show you how you can use topology to give you results in algebra, uh, perhaps some fundamental results. This is the fundamental theorem of algebra. And here's the theorem. It states that every non-constant polynomial in C, so complex coefficients, has a root in C. So some real polynomials, such as x squared plus 1, they're never equal to 0. What this is saying is that every complex polynomial actually does have a 0, unless it's constant, of course. Let's prove it. All right, so by dividing by the leading term, we're just looking for roots, so I can assume my polynomial is monic. We get uh, my polynomial is z to the n plus a n minus 1, z to the n minus 1, all the way up to a naught. Okay, so I've taken an arbitrary complex polynomial here. Now, if this polynomial has no roots in C, then we can define for each real number r a continuous function which I will call frs. And this is going to be a little bit of an involved formula, but you'll see how it all plays out. It says p of r times e to the 2 pi i s divided by p of r over the modulus of the same thing up there, p of r times e to the 2 pi i s divided by p of r. And this function goes from the interval into the complex numbers. But in particular, note that I've taken a complex number and then I've divided by its modulus. And when you do that, you get a modulus 1 complex number. And modulus 1 complex numbers lie on the unit circle. So this is a function from i to s1, right? And note that fr of 0 is equal to fr of 1. This is just the uh, 2 pi uh, cyclicness of e to the 2 pi i. So this is a loop in S1. So I needed this 
polynomial to not have a zero in order to be able to divide by p of r. All right, now, here's another thing to notice. This, this function exists for all of r, but for every real number r. So at r is equal to zero, this is the constant loop. So f r of s defines a null homotopy. of, well, itself, f r of s. Now, choose a very large uh, r. So what do I mean by very large? I mean larger than 1 and also larger than the sum of the moduli of all of the coefficients, a0 plus a1 plus the modulus a2, all the way up to the modulus of a n minus 1. Okay, now for z having modulus r, we get that the modulus of z to the n is, well, modulus is multiplicative. It's r times r to the n minus 1. And this is greater than, well, r was bigger than the sum of absolute values. So let me just replace that r with this. a0 plus a1 plus all the way up to a n minus 1 times the modulus of z to the n minus 1. So now, since r is bigger than 1, and you know the modulus of z is equal to r, um, we get that the modulus of z is bigger than 1. So essentially, I can distribute this inequality in and get that uh, the modulus of z to the n is greater than the modulus of a0 plus a1z plus all the way up to a n minus 1 z to the n minus 1. I'm sort of squishing together a, a couple of inequalities here, but I don't want to get too much into the details there, but you can check it. So uh, now let this new family of polynomials, pt, be equal to z to the n plus t times a n minus 1 z to the n minus 1 plus all the way up to a naught be a family of polynomials now uh, let me remind you of this formula here it's a couple screens ago so recall that f r of s is p of r e to the 2 pi i s divided by p of r all over the modulus of the same thing, p of r e to the 2 pi i s mod p of r. So this was a, a thing giving a loop, and I can plug in the polynomials p t into here. Plugging in pt into the above formula, gives a homotopy from fr of s, this is at t is equal to 1, to omega n of s, which is e to the 2 pi i n s. And this is when t is equal to 0. So you can check this. It's straightforward. 
at, at t is equal to zero, this polynomial is just z to the n. And if you plug in z to the n into this formula and let s go between zero and one, you get this generator of the fundamental group that runs around the circle n times. What's the problem here? Well, letting r go from zero to one gives a homotopy from uh, the trivial loop to uh, f1 of s, but letting t go to zero takes this loop to omega n of s. So what does that mean? So omega n of s, just sliding r one way and then sliding t the other way, is homotopic to a constant loop. And this is a contradiction. We've showed last time that this is not homotopic to a constant loop. Well, almost, unless n happens to be zero. And if n is zero, remember n was the degree of this polynomial. So all non-constant polynomials in C have roots. So that's going to do it for today. We've pretty much exhausted the spaces whose fundamental groups we can calculate using our existing techniques. So next class, we'll embark on a journey to prove Van Kampen's theorem, which will let us uh, deduce the fundamental group of many more spaces. Also, I wanted to say that there are many, many more interesting consequences of this fundamental group calculation of S1, and you could find about three more of them in Hatcher if you're interested. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.